Colonel. Some time ago, uh, South East Queensland musician Mojo Webb was uh, talking to me and was uh, wondering aloud what it would be like to play through the same amplifier that Charlie Christian used on those early electric jazz recordings in the 1930s and into the early 40s. And uh, that kind of got me thinking, and so it started off the current project. Before the Second World War, Gibson were very early on the scene, uh, providing these newfangled electric guitar amplifiers. And uh, beginning in 1935 with the E150, then the EH150, which you see on the right hand side, and finishing up in 1941 with the EH185 on the left. This is famous for being used by notable jazz guitarists like Charlie Christian. The 185 had the removable uh, amp head that you see in the foreground. I've managed to find a vintage plywood speaker cabinet somewhat reminiscent of this Gibson EH150 with the rounded shoulders at the top and I'm going to use that to house my version of one of the circuits uh, used for the EH185. The circuits for these early Gibson amps, the EH150 and later the EH185, went through a number of revisions and there were three main versions of the circuit uh, mainly with changes in the preamp. The early amps used a, a pentode tube uh, as the first tube in the preamp. I've chosen a, a later version which uses all triodes in the, uh, the preamp. So we've got three 6SQ7s and uh, a twin triode, 6N7, as the phase inverter, a pair of 6L6s, cathode biased, uh, as the output tubes, and there's a 5U4 rectifier. These early amps used field coil speakers. Uh, permanent magnet speakers came on later. I'll be using a permanent magnet speaker and in place of the speaker field coil, I'll be putting in uh, a choke. Now the 6SQ7 is a uh, modern standard. It's, it's equivalent to half of a 12AX7. Uh, so this had the highest available gain factor uh, of the uh, triodes at the time. There are two in inputs. There's the instrument input which goes to one of the triodes. So it's only got one uh, gain stage before it hits the phase inverter. The other one, the microphone input, has two gain stages. And so for guitar players this gives us an option of a, a clean channel and a very lively uh, channel if you're using the microphone input with options for some quite uh, lovely overdrive. And having checked everything topside, it's a good idea before chopping holes in things to flip the chassis over and just place things roughly where you think they're going to go and make sure that for example the uh, the board there is room for that as I said it's going to be a little bit tight but I think we should be okay there are lots of holes to drill in this chassis and uh, I'm glad this is aluminium rather than steel. But uh, I use a, a hole saw 
You can buy these in uh, in kits, different sizes. So this one's 25 millimeters, and this is for the Octal um, tube sockets. And I like to clamp the job and have a piece of scrap pine underneath, so that helps to hold the the center the center bit of the hole saw uh, on the job. And then when it's done, the edges of the holes can be a little bit rough. And so, I used to use a round file, but um, I found one of these gadgets. This is a deburring tool, and I just got that from a local hardware store. And uh, that does the job very nicely, particularly with the softer aluminium. So, one more to do, back to the job. Okay, I've got all my major orifices done. Something I now need to think about is how I'm going to orient the sockets. Um, one thing to think about is the heater wiring. Now for the six L6s, the heaters go to pins 2 and 7, almost one on either side, but with the preamp tubes, the heater wires go to pins 7 and 8, and it would be useful, I think, to have those at the back, up against the, uh, the edge of the chassis and out of the way, and away from the signal wiring. And then the other thing to think about is, do I do the modern thing of the heater wires in twisted pairs, sort of, you know, up and over, uh, or do I go old school, because this is, after all, a 1930s amplifier, which would be to ground one heater connection uh, to the chassis at each socket, and then just have one live wire uh, running from one uh, socket to the next. So that might uh, introduce a little bit more hum, but it's much simpler and neater. So I'll think about those things. And here we go showing the last minute location of all the tubes prior to drilling the holes for the output transformer. So, I hope I've made the right decisions. I've just put in mounting holes for the output transformer and also holes for the leads to and from the output transformer and most importantly I've installed rubber grommets here. Um, the nasty things can happen if you have uh, wires uh, running through and rubbing up against bare metal, which may be a little bit on the sharp side, bit of vibration, and you can get uh, easily get a short circuit. So the, the grommets are important. Uh, the other thing I've done is, uh, once I've put in the tube sockets and decided what goes where, I've flipped over the chassis and I've written down what those tubes are. Uh, because um, when you're working on the top side, you can think you know where everything is, but it can be uh, discombobulating when you turn things over and your brain has to reconfigure where everything is much easier if you write the names of the tubes in. So here we are another step forward I've got the choke attached to the back of the chassis um, everything installed uh, across the control panel and I've soldered up uh, and populated the board. It would have been more period correct if uh, I had wired up all the components point to point and probably would have made better use of the space but 
but um, uh, for the sake of neatness and for making any changes, having the components on the board uh, made a little bit more sense. And um, already there's uh, a little bit of conflict between neighbours here. I've got the um, on-off switch is uh, getting very close to some of the contacts on the uh, the rectifier tube so I'm going to have to make sure that everything's properly insulated in case things accidentally touch. Um, so a minor uh, hassle but uh, but nothing major. So continuing. Well it's not quite completed yet but I'm a fair way into the wiring up of the amplifier. I've left the power transformer out until the very last moment because it's so heavy and cumbersome uh, it's a lot easier to manage the chassis without that extra weight there. So I'm actually leaving the power supply wiring until the end. Um, I've even though it's a, a 1930s amp, and I was tempted to use uh, the wiring procedures of that era, point-to-point uh, -point wiring, but I've just decided to keep things a little bit more organised uh, with an eyelet board. And as far as grounding schemes go, uh, I'm using the more modern idea of having one ground for the power supply and another ground uh, right up here near the input uh, for the preamp. Now the only exception I've made to that is the cathode resistors for the preamp tubes. Um, if I put the, uh, the cathode resistors and bypass caps on the board I'd have wires going all over the place. Um, so uh, here's the phase inverter and that's the uh, the cathode resistor there and I've grounded that uh, to a lug on the socket and then uh, here we are again over here with the preamp uh, tubes uh, one there and another one there and I've just grounded those nice and close to the sockets and I'm hoping that won't result in any hum. Um, also of course the output tubes I've uh, put in screen resistors and um, uh, grid blockers and I've placed those on the sockets nice and close trying to keep the wiring to uh, a reasonable standard although as you can see there's a fair bit of spaghetti starting to emerge not quite done yet, but I'm a fair way along. Uh, one other thing I should mention is that uh, some builders like to put in the uh, the filament wiring first um, and get that out of the way. In this case, I'm leaving that till last. Now, for these old octal tubes, uh, the filaments are wired to pins 7 and 8 and I've oriented the sockets so that pins 7 and 8 are right at the back uh, up against the side of the chassis so I'm going to be running the uh, the heat wires uh, from socket to socket along uh, the edge here and that should keep them out of the way and I'm pretty sure that's going to be easier to do at the end I certainly hope so. Well I've got to the point where everything is wired up except for the power supply and uh, my decision to leave that till last I think was a good one because I did have to uh, manhandle the chassis a little bit to drill some extra holes. I decided to mount the cathode, the output tubes cathode resistor uh, off the board and had to drill a few extra holes and it was a lot easier to flip the chassis over without the very heavy power transformer. I've also got the um, the heater wiring in place 
uh, in the uh, the currently accepted style of up and over with tightly twisted wires. The uh, wires for the output tubes um, I've put differently coloured wires so that I could make sure that the polarity uh, between the two uh, 6L6s was uh, in phase. Uh, I apologise for not filming my um, wonderful soldering technique but it was just too difficult to set up a tripod and, uh, and do all that stuff. But you can find people online if, uh, if you want tips on soldering and there are other people online who can do that for you. As you can see there are shielded cables um, running from the uh, the tube sockets to the volume controls um, and hopefully that's going to cut down noise so unless I've forgotten something uh, everything there is ready to go. I will of course go through the schematic step by step checking all my work. I really should have been going through um, the schematic uh, with a, a neon pen and marking off everything as I did it. I think that's the accepted technique and I think that's a very good idea. But hey, I didn't do that. On to the next step. Good news. The amp works well and um, the speaker I'm using is an early 1960s Australian Alnico MSP 12 inch speaker, uh, which sounds very nice. By the way, if you can hear a little noise in the background, it's the whirly bird um, in the ceiling of my shed, which is extracting some of the heat here in the northern part of Australia. It's a little bit warm even in March. Okay, back to the subject. Um, I've had a couple of um, guitarists play through the amp and you're going to hear from them in just a little while. I still haven't decided what to do with the finish on uh, the cabinet and I may just uh, sit on that for a moment and leave it for another video. The guitarists who've used the amp uh, feel that it's going to sound better with an open back um, but uh, obviously we don't want people touching uh, nasty things in the back I do have the original back door for the um, for the cabinet that I'm using and one option is to get some clips so that this can be clipped on for uh, carrying the amp or even uh, while it's in use and uh, so there's the option of having um, a back on the amp uh, which is removable so we'll think about that and as I said that may be the subject for another video on now to the demonstrations with first of all Mr. Mike Frost uh, playing straight into the amp with no effects, first of all with a Telecaster and then with uh, a Gibson 335 uh, with humbuckers and then you'll be hearing from Mr JB Lewis using uh, another Gibson with humbuckers uh, and with the assistance of a um, Fender spring reverb unit. Um, so I hope you enjoy that and I hope you enjoy the video. Come back, there will be more. Yep.
Thank <laughs> you. 